everybody. Uh, my name is Henry Hale. I am a professor of international affairs and political science at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs and uh, also at the Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies at GW, which is celebrating its 60th uh, anniversary this year. Um, and as part of a, a series of uh, events that we are um, sponsoring or co-sponsoring, uh, we are very happy today to bring you what I think will be a fabulous discussion on Russian grand strategy, um, featuring two of the uh, best experts on this topic, um, I think that are out there. Um, Samuel Cherup, of, uh, who is senior uh, political scientist at RAND, and uh, Dara Masico, who is senior policy researcher at RAND. And they've recently authored a uh, report, Russian grand strategy, rhetoric and reality. So um, without further ado, let me turn uh, things over to the authors. I believe uh, Samuel will um, uh, lead off. And uh, I think they plan to talk for about 25, 30 minutes, and then that will leave us about half an hour for discussions. I would just ask you, uh, please pose your questions in the chat, either directly to me or um, to everyone. And um, then I will, uh, we have a large group today. We have, uh, so, so basically I'll just, I'll moderate the questions. I'll, I'll, I'll read the questions out to the, um, uh, to the speakers. So uh, thank you, um, Sam. Great. Um, thank you, Henry. Let me see if I can get my screen share working here. Hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, well, uh, thank you all for joining us. And thanks again, Henry um, and to uh, Iris um, for, for hosting this, um, uh, as well as to Marlene, who uh, I guess is not here today, but uh, was involved in uh, putting all this together. Um, so uh, Dara and I are, are presenting a report where, for which a project for which we were the uh, principal investigators, uh, although we had a, a broader team, which we'll uh, introduce towards the end of this presentation, um, called uh, Russian Grand Strategy, Rhetoric and Reality, which uh, was uh, released um, last month uh, and is available for downloading on um, RAND.org. Um, I should caveat this by saying, although it was released last month, um, the text was finalized some time ago uh, and um, was uh, took a while to get through various review processes. Um, so we don't didn't have the chance to incorporate uh, into our analysis most uh, you know a number of recent events and even uh, unfortunately the latest national security strategy. But I think um, uh, our findings do hold up, which uh, I think perhaps. Um, uh, we can uh, put a feather in our cap for having uh, completed this text actually um, not, not that recently. And nonetheless, I think the, the findings of the research uh, are still valid. So um, let's start with um, some uh, uh, definitions briefly. Um, we, uh, you know, grand strategy is a term that's often thrown around um, and uh, not particularly well defined. Um, we had the benefit of having on our team Miranda Preeb, who's uh, not only was uh, a uh, wrote her dissertation under Barry Posen at MIT, but also now directs the RAND uh, Center for the Study of US Grand Strategy. Um, and so in the report, we get into some detail about what, how to really understand grand strategy in a, in a rigorous way. Um, and we, but we use the Posen, uh, you know, sort of one sentence um, definition that you see on your screen here uh, as our baseline, that it's a theory about how to present, uh, produce security for uh, a state. And it's not something that uh, you will find in a single document. Um, it's something that you can piece together based on a number of different sources and uh, documents and statements from uh, senior leaders. It not only um, is about how to produce security, but what are the threats to security, and uh, and therefore it sort of provides clues to how states will respond to developments in the international system. And it really tries to get at the logic that undergirds um, uh, foreign policy rather than the policies themselves. Um, and so we chose to study Russian grand strategy in this context, and uh, we're sponsored to do so, but um, in part because the uh, this kind of a study can provide important insights into the direction of Russian foreign policy and how it might respond in the future to different uh, national security challenges. And specifically for the US, it can help um, potentially avoid strategic surprise and uh, assess the nature of um, conflicts uh, between the US and Russia. So 
Um, our, our core research questions were actually defining Russia's brand strategy um, and then trying to do something uh, quite specific, which was basically assessing whether the words Russia says and writes at an official level are matched by um, empirical observations of actions, behavior, and resource decisions. So um, going beyond just describing what, uh, what that grand strategy is, trying to see whether it's reflected in uh, observable behavior. And finally, asking what the uh, implications of this analysis are for US policymakers. Um, and so we, we basically picked uh, what we thought were some of the most important elements of the stated grand strategy. And for each of them, developed a method of testing whether um, the stated brand strategy matches the actions, behavior, and resource decisions that we could observe. Um, and we went through a rather comprehensive review of both the official uh, strategy documents, the national security strategy, the foreign policy concept, the military doctrine, various other strategies like the energy security strategy, information security strategy, and so on. Russia likes to put out a lot of these things. Um, and, as well as a number of key speeches and uh, statements from leaders and you know laws and other policies that are relevant to this. And we did a bunch of uh, interviews in Moscow and reading of um, uh, foreign policy uh, expert opinions on this subject, looking at a you know pretty exhaustive uh, quantity of sources to try to be able to describe this. And in the report, we get into a uh, extended discussion of how we characterize Russia's broader grand strategy. But um, just to frame our, our uh, more specific um, uh, analysis that you'll hear um, in shortly, you know, the broad contours that we found is that you know, Russian decision makers believe the current international order is transitioning away from a Western-centric, US-led, almost unipolar system to a so-called polycentric world um, where power will be more equally distributed uh, among a broader range of states. Um, and that this transition is not only inevitable, but desirable um, because it will result in greater global stability and prosperity. And of course, a more prominent role for Russia uh, as a key regional leader and major power. But also that this transition period that we're in um, is going to feature rising geopolitical instability, greater potential for conflicts, uh, and that, that particularly those that result from a pernicious mix of internal unrest and external aggression. Um, and, you know, as a result, Russia will require a strong military to, to defend itself during this period and, and to defend itself from a variety of threats, um, but particularly those emanating from its immediate neighborhood. Um, of course, at the end of this, Russia believes that it will be one of several leading centers of power um, with the leadership role in, uh, in post-Soviet Eurasia and, uh, and increased global clout. Um, but that's the sort of Cliff Notes version. And we were presented with this big picture view of uh, the world and what it means for Russia. And we tried to break it down. Basically, we, we chose six key elements of that big picture that I just described. Um, based on uh, their centrality for the overall strategy, their importance for US interests, um, and uh, also because they are subject to debate among in the field among uh, Russia scholars and uh, the broader policy community. Um, so uh, we, um, for each of the uh, six, we, we present hypotheses about corresponding actions that would obtain if the stated grand strategy were true, and also alternative hypotheses, essentially, with alternative corresponding actions, if there are other explanations uh, that might um, uh, uh, obtain. In other words, if the stated grand strategy is not, in fact, reflected in Russian behavior. And so we tried to test those hypotheses against empirical observations for each of the six. And today, we're going to present them um, not in the order in which they appear on the subsequent slides and even in the report, but uh, in order of primary authorship um, with me starting out. So we, uh, Darren and I had uh, led different teams for each of these, um, but according to our respective specialties with Dara focusing more on the military centric ones and I took more of the sort of political military foreign policy 
uh, uh, of the of the six. So just briefly to outline them. Uh, so the six elements we chose to analyze more deeply um, were first uh, about um, and just to emphasize, of course, that these are this is what Russia says, so to speak, on an official level. Uh, this is the the uh, stated elements of um, uh, Russian grand strategy, not our analysis. Um, and for each of these six, we describe what Russia says and then use that to generate hypotheses about behavior. Um, and in each chapter, we present a different, you know, uh, essentially assessment method for how we went about evaluating uh, the claims implicit in this, in this, uh, in these arguments or these these elements of Russian grand strategy. So uh, the first uh, being about the domestic instability and interstate war being increasingly integrated, and uh, as a result, Russia must be prepared accordingly. The second is how Russia portrays itself as a regional leader uh, in post-Soviet Eurasia. The third um, being the kind of analysis about the nature of conflicts that Russia should be uh, best prepared to, uh, to deal with, which uh, according to its stated strategy are both small wars on the periphery and um, potential non-contact warfare, as it's called, uh, uh, with peer adversaries. Um, the fourth uh, is uh, the conclusion that you, that we read into Russia's stated strategy that uh, Moscow has basically set, uh, concluded that it has no need to develop a out of area expeditionary military uh, and instead will be focused on the capabilities to deal with regional contingencies. Um, the fifth is about Russia's objectives vis a vis the West. Um, Russia says that its objective is not to weaken the West and Western institutions. Instead, it's, it seeks selective cooperation while taking steps to limit. Uh, Western ambitions and change its foreign policy behavior. And finally, we assess the sort of uh, claimed pivot that Russia is, it, you know, along with its analysis of how where the international system is going, that Russia itself is pivoting its international political and economic focus away from the West and towards uh, the so-called new centers of power, as they're called in these documents. So I will um, begin with uh, some of our, with our discussion of the three um, uh, chapters of three elements for which I had the, the lead role. Um, and uh, on the question of the Russia's regional leadership strategy, um, of course, in, in the official documents, Russia portrays itself as a benign regional leader that's uh, focused on um, integration efforts in its neighborhood. And our objective in the report was to assess that claim, essentially, and uh, the extent to which Russia's actions reflect those declarations. Um, so to do so, we devised um, different frameworks for possible relationships that a regional hegemon could have with smaller neighboring states uh, derived from political science literature. And we had a framework of possible hierarchical uh, relationships ranging from like the most imperial to the most, you know, hands off. And uh, somewhere in the middle is where Russia portrays itself. Somewhere perhaps closer towards the imperial is where most uh, analysts would perhaps put Russia. Um, and we developed, you know, hypothesized um, behaviors that would accord to those different kinds of expectations about uh, hierarchical relationships. Um, and basically, uh, that allowed us to generate expectations for whether Russia is behaving as it says it is or pursuing the imperialistic policies that many allege. And we found that, you know, there, this is a very mixed picture and that Russia has resorted to coercion, of course, largely in attempts to block outcomes inconsistent with its goals of regional integration. Um, and, but in several cases that that coercion has failed and Moscow seems to have reconciled itself to outcomes that are significantly less than what it says it wants. Of course, Ukraine is a major exception where Russia has not only resorted to more coercive actions than in other cases, but also doesn't seem to accept not getting what it wants. Um, but the cases of non-coercion are also uh, quite interesting in this context. Um, you know, uh, demonstrating that Russia, I think, does accept a variety of hierarchical relationships with its neighbors. So a variety of more or less compliant states like Kazakhstan are spared coercion. Um, 
but so are ones that seek distance from Moscow, like Azerbaijan. Um, but of course, in all those cases, defection to the West has never really been on the table. On the whole, we, we see little evidence of a comprehensive regional strategy of imperial domination. Uh, Moscow's actions seem aimed at achieving its goals of regional integration, um, but it has often failed to achieve those objectives. And when it does fail, it's modified its objectives and accepted lower levels of hierarchy in its relationships with its neighbors. So the overall consistent a picture is one of inconsistency or even incoherence rather than a um, co uh, comprehensive plan. Um, in terms of the uh, relationship with the West, of course, um, here, as I mentioned, the claim that Russia makes is that it uh, is seeking to selectively cooperate um, while uh, limiting Western ambitions, but not weakening the West. Uh, that, that, of course, is not mentioned in any of the, any of the strategic documents or leadership statements. In fact, the leaders deny that objective. Um, but the documents do highlight a range of concerns or objections to Western foreign policy. Um, so uh, many analysts, of course, uh, believe that Russia's real objectives vis-a-vis the West differ dramatically from these official pronouncements. Um, and they suggest that Russia's uh, declared desire for cooperation is in fact disingenuous uh, and that Russia has far more, more far reaching uh, ambitions uh, in terms of pushing back against the West. And that is to weaken the West by sowing discord, um, which of course is not what Russia says. Uh, now, there are incentives for the Russian government uh, to uh, dissemble in its public pronouncements of its uh, objectives, particularly when uh, those objectives, if they were stated openly, would be considered quite inflammatory. Um, but we develop a, a framework in the chapter for distinguishing between diff these different propositions about Russia's objectives by generating a set of expected behaviors uh, associated with each. And we look uh, in more detail at both the question of interference and um, cooperation with the West. And the overall uh, picture is complex. Um, Clearly, a number of actions that Russia's taken since 2014 are inconsistent with the stated strategy. Um, and particularly the interference efforts that uh, seemingly had no relation to um, political outcomes that were documented in a number of the US government official reporting on the 2016 election interference. So they couldn't be plausibly linked to specific Russian interests and thus inconsistent with the view that Russia uh, that, and thus they're consistent with the view that Moscow seeks to weaken the West for um, uh, to achieve the, precisely that outcome. But there is this ongoing and continued Russian outreach to and cooperation with the West after 2014. So there's a contradiction here, the pursuit of cooperation while um, uh, also uh, weakening the West. And, you know, a possible behavior for that is that this is the efforts to weaken the West are seen as a means of uh, changing Western foreign policy by ending greater Western activism or on the regional and global levels. Um, but if that's in fact the case, it's, it's highly counterproductive because it's rendered um, cooperation with Russia basically politically toxic in, um, in uh, many Western capitals. But Moscow seems unwilling uh, or unable to accept the consequences of that and uh, continues to pursue these two lines of effort um, without acknowledging that one that is sowing uh, discord in the West um, makes the other cooperation um, impossible. And uh, finally, to conclude the, the parts of the study that I uh, had the most direct hand in, um, we, we looked at trying to assess the, uh, the so-called pivot, um, the Russian pivot, that is, uh, the, away from the West and towards new centers of power. And um, we wanted to test the rhetoric here. Um, a lot of people had skepticism about the rhetoric, stating that, you know, really uh, the West still remained the most important partner, even if it's an adversary, uh, that um, Russia wasn't taking the, um, that the, that the engagement with the rest of the world, particularly the Asia Pacific, um, was, more just a ploy to, um, to uh, show the world that Russia had options. Um, but what we did is try to look uh, at, we created a number of original data sets trying to measure government effort at engagement with uh, different sets of countries. And we looked specifically at 
um, what are abbreviated here in the in the bottom chart, um, MPK, that is uh, intergovernmental uh, commissions, um, and we these are um, you know interagency uh, bilateral platforms that bring together a range of senior officials to uh, between governments to discuss a variety of issues, and we documented. Um, dividing the uh, data by Western and non-Western countries, um, where Russia has had more of these uh, uh, meetings at the ministerial level or higher from 2012 to 2017. And we see a clear trend there as demonstrated by the orange bars um, where uh, engagement with non-Western countries has uh, in fact, um, you know, significantly increased uh, and that this trend was accelerated dramatically after 2014. And we see that come through in, um, if you look at the chart on the top of the page, uh, bilateral visits by select Russian ministers. Here, we excluded um, the foreign minister because of course the foreign minister visits a number of countries for reasons that have nothing to do with um, their, the, the Russia's interest in that country. You know, it could be a place like Vienna where there are a bunch of international institutions or because of scheduled visits. But here we looked at what are called line ministers uh, like the minister of energy, um, the Minister of Agriculture, um, ministers who don't have to travel, um, but when they do, uh, suggest that the state is putting in effort to achieve an outcome. And here again, we see a similar trend. And we looked at the same kind of data, um, trying to look at a number of different other metrics. And uh, for example, like uh, state-owned enterprises and where they were putting their, um, uh, the bulk of their effort and saw a similar trend. So here we really do see a match um, between the rhetoric of the pivot and the reality of Russia's uh, efforts that it put in uh, to, uh, to make that a reality. Um, and so I will hand it off to, uh, to Dara. Thanks, Sam. So I'm going to walk us through the final three elements and then end with some observations and implications from our study. And then we can turn it over back to Henry for Q&A. So the fourth element that we are going to discuss is the increasing integration between Russian military and Russian internal security forces. So if you look into their strategy, there is an articulated need um, and an increasing relationship between these two groups. They think that there is a relationship between external military conflict and domestic instability. And that starting you know, in years prior, uh, oops, there, whoop. <laughs> there we are, thank you, Sam. Um, starting in years prior to the present and to the future, there is a belief that Russia's enemies will destabilize the Russian home front to make it weaker, either preceding a conflict or concurrent with one. So the government in that context wishes to have different groups of forces with different specialties that can interact in complex ways to solve this complex challenge. So we find through our research that there is a match here between strategy and practice. And to evaluate this, we considered structural modifications to the Russian military and the internal security services, like new policies, new legislation, um, training, uh, integrated command and control pathways. And we also considered federal funding expenditures for the military versus that internal security spending and different types of force restructuring, uh, particularly among Russian, uh, Russia's new National Guard that they created five years ago from different organizations from um, within Russia. So we find that um, Russia has been very active in this area for the last eight or nine years. Part of that is due to uh, Russian military leadership really prioritizing this concept of um, partial mobilization or whole of government mobilization to um, internal crises that may be externally fomented or they may be domestically occurring. We find that they are very busy um, test uh, testing, modifying, and integrating these two groups to function together in a crisis. So the one area that we didn't find a ton of activity um, was the actual um, force participation, where during a military exercise you would have military and National Guard operating together, that doesn't really occur too much. But if trends continue on the way they are right now, we would expect to see in the future the establishment of more joint task forces, um, increased joint training between the National Guard and the military, 
to respond to internal crises and potentially the limited use of National Guard abroad. They have specialized tools that you could imagine would be very helpful in some of Russia's crisis areas right now, like um, crowd control, border control, counter drug, um, and they legally can be used abroad and subordinate to the military. Uh, next slide, please. Our fifth element is doing a deep dive into Russian military strategy and how they conceptualize war of the future and how they should prioritize among different echelons of conflict. Russia is in a unique situation where they have to be prepared for low end sort of um, counterterrorism type of engagements all the way up to global nuclear war. And there's four echelons of warfare in their strategic thinking. So their official military strategy emphasizes that non-contact warfare, which is defined in different ways, but I'll, I'll give you the Cliffs notes if you're not familiar with the term, it's um, long range or medium range precision strike, um, different types of non-kinetic effects like cyber information warfare, potentially space or counter space capabilities. That's non-contact. Uh, the opposite of that is uh, your more traditional force on force engagement. Um, they believe that small conflicts uh, along the border are the most likely types of conflicts that they will be experiencing. And those have the tendency, of course, always to escalate, but that's what's on the books. So we do find that there is a bit of a partial divergence here between strategy and practice that emerged particularly after 2014, but there were some indications that it was occurring a few years before that as well. To evaluate this particular element, we considered changes to Russian force posture, procurement patterns um, up to 2027, I think, um, Russia's mobilization system, and what types of training events and what kind of trends we can determine from that. We found that although the, straight, the stated strategy is still true, um, the aerospace domain is very important. It's considered a center of gravity. Russia needs these high-end capabilities um, and they are investing quite a lot in some of their conventional assets that have a, a broader range. These sectors today are comparatively less of a priority um, than initially envisioned over a decade ago under, a previous, uh, uh, under the previous military leadership team. We find that Russia is reintroducing larger and more heavily armored formations back into the army the airborne and the naval infantry, which is kind of like our Marines, but they're different. Uh, Russian training exercises tend to focus on a high-end adversary and at a higher echelon of combat. So um, in, in our view, the regional level of war, which is like three, three of four, four being large-scale war, you know, World War II, big blocks um, clashing against one another. So we're not, we're not at the top, but we're um, it's certainly a bit higher um, echelon than they articulate. So if Russia's force posture modifications and enhancements over this uh, period of evaluation or any clue of Russia's priorities, and it's, it's been my experience that they generally are a pretty good proxy, it's clear that it's important for Russia um, to establish new or bigger forces near Ukraine and Belarus um, as a main priority with a um, secondary focus that's not far behind of reinforcing Northwestern Russia and Kaliningrad. Um, we don't see evidence from Russia's mobilization patterns, from their defense base, from their orders of battle, or even their military manning emphasis now and in, in 10 years into the future, that Russia um, is or will be structurally able to support a protracted um, conventional World War II style of war, of territorial occupation in any type of large or meaningful way um, it's just, it's not in their strategy and it's, it's just not um, in their force structure. Um, next slide, please. And then our final element here, um, the Russian strategy does not articulate the need for them to have an expeditionary or out of area military um, beyond um, the global range of its nuclear triad, which of course needs that kind of range. So in our study, we define expeditionary force um, and out of area operations as a transit to a country that is not contiguous with Russia. So transit to Tajikistan, no, not an out of area, transit to Afghanistan, or that, that is, um, Syria is, those type of things. 
Um, in Russian strategy, the bulk of Russia's non-nuclear you know, strategic triad is designed for regional contingencies and defending uh, Russian territory. So we find here again that there's, there's a match. Uh, we evaluated Russia's military structure in particular ways, um, both present and future, for three key pillars needed to support an expeditionary force. And those are um, readiness, sustainability, and mobility. And these three requisite areas are necessary for a military that is primarily oriented to operate abroad like this. Um, for example, along the, the lines of the United States or the Soviet Union or uh, some of our NATO allies. We find that for Russia, these three pillars are fragile at best and lacking altogether in some of these crucial areas. Um, in readiness, there are issues with equipment serviceability and manning. In sustainability, Russia lacks a forward uh, a network of forward bases and logistics that's permanent um, with the exception of Syria. Uh, in theater support from allies and partners, Russia does not have allies that can support its combat operations other than using its territory for throughput in an ad hoc kind of a way. And it has problems with mobility. We see insufficient strategic airlift, insufficient strategic um, sea lift, secure, codified deployment routes or any type of really modular force structure, um, even among its traditional rapid reaction forces. Uh, we're seeing even the VDV or you know, some of these first responders becoming very heavy over time. Like why does the VDV need tanks? It's not an army light, but we do see this trend um, happening across the force. So um, how then do we explain why Russia is in Syria or how they can operate in Syria and for that one, um, it's important to remember that Syria is a very limited force size. At its peak, we were looking at 3,000 to 5,000 tops. Um, it's an ad hoc and makeshift capability that cannot so easily be re replicated elsewhere. Um, events like Syria do show that Russia is capable of assembling a modest force for small or niche applications where its national security interests are at stake and if they can get there, which is another um, crucial element. Um, next slide, please. So just to, um, just to bring this home for some of the observations that we have um, looking at all of these things together, we find that Russia's stated, stated grand strategy can generally be considered a pretty reliable predictor of the state's efforts. So there are specific goals. They do tend to be a little lofty at times, but when we look at their implementation of them, we find that their actions and their resource decisions uh, to implement them can be experimental, which can be bad or good, ambiguous, which can be bad or good for their purposes, and maybe a little reactive. So we find that um, the Ukraine crisis in 2014 really had a lasting impact on Russian uh, implementation of its grand strategy. It knocked him off course a little bit. And we think the Maidan revolution was a bit of an exogenous shock to them. It's had uh, the effect of sharpening threat perceptions and altering their political priorities and certainly their economic outlook and, and related um, their military posture itself. But for Russia, their, their problems in implementing their strategy, there are shaky economic foundations here. There's opposition to Russian plans, even in its immediate post-Soviet neighborhood that we talked about, let alone at the global level. So if you read the strategy, they all there's these logical pieces that tend to fit together and you can deduce that there's a prioritization there. But in reality, um, the Kremlin is, has a pervasive insecurity and it is attempting to create buffers against multiple fronts of instability at one time. Often this is at odds with that strategy prioritization. And if you are living in a world of limited resources, what this is going to do, it's going to limit you from having optimal resource allocation and it's gonna constrain your already constrained resources even further. But despite of all of these challenges or we see them feeling out different ways to implement the grand strategy um, through their, their actions, through their deeds, we, we find that Russia's revealed grand strategy is not fundamentally divergent from what's on the page. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have just a few implications and, and these are mostly oriented um, towards um, the army, the, the sponsor of um, this particular report. 
Um, but we find that strategic competition will be most intense around Russia's post-Soviet Eurasian periphery. That's probably not a surprise. But Russia's approach and influence really does vary from country to country in this region. They can use multiple forms of coercion if they need to, although not to impose total control, but to prevent their neighbors from integrating into rival economic and security blocks. We find that uh, looking forward into the future, Russia is going to continue to diversify and shift away from the West. The implication of that being as they attempt to um, separate their economy where they can separate um, politically and find like-minded partners in different regions, over time, this may, this may lessen the impact of sanctions or other types of Western political leverage to influence Russian behavior. And we find that uh, Russia's defense budget has been plateauing roughly since uh, 2018. It's not really shown a lot of growth as they are allocating money elsewhere more um, towards domestic spending. But their military requirements have not plateaued. And so they are, are really trying um, to make progress in multiple areas at one time here from developing and modernizing really high end uh, weapons like hypersonics, maintaining a high level of readiness and waging um, to various degrees two limited conflicts um, abroad, all on a constrained budget. Um, this means that they're only going to make limited progress in these areas since they have not really prioritized among them. Um, and our final slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the divergence in Russian threat perceptions and the actions that they are taking on the ground versus this uh, sort of basket of military strategy that can be resident in the doctrine and even um, a publication that came out after our report was written on, on Russian nuclear use, we find that uh, Russia could opt to revise the doctrine in coming years to align that, um, bring it back into threat perceptions and, and actions. Uh, we think that if they were to do that, uh, any revision would uh, emphasize uh, the growing um, capacity for these types of larger scale interstate uh, military clashes and potentially even um, blaming the United States focus on great power competition as a rationale. We expect Russian training events to um, grow larger and larger over time. That's an, a longer term um, sort of desire for them. They've had it for about a decade, but it's uh, also quite timely because Zapad's going on uh, this afternoon, um, this week. So, um, you know, we are on a trend line to where you can see units from all across Russia participating in these things at one time. And then finally, while Russia, um, as we discussed, they, they're not developing a traditional model of an expeditionary force, but they are using their tools creatively. And it's important to remember that they have the ability to use soft private military contractors, intel operatives, sometimes supported with uh, military power, sometimes not, that can be used abroad to allow Russia to influence events. Um, so that particular trend is ongoing and expanding. And, you know, we may be sort of at the cusp of um, a, a new type of model of expeditionary power. Um, and so with that, um, that concludes um, our, our presentation. And this is our research team, rock stars, all of them. And there's a, a permalink down there to our report, if you would um, like to read it. And we're happy to um, take any of your questions. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you very much for a, a very uh, impressive report and um, interesting analysis. Uh, accordingly, there are lots of questions. Um, so I don't know if we'll be able to get to them all. So I apologize in advance. But let me also say, if you have questions, please do go ahead and post them in the chat. Um, and I'll kind of group them together where there might be kind of common threads as a way of trying to getting through everything. But um, maybe let me start with this question from John Mueller, because I think it gets at some of the big picture implications and kind of the larger takeaways that might uh, come out of this, which is, um, he asks, uh, you seem to suggest that Russia essentially presents no security threat to the US. If so, should US policy basically be to do nothing in this area? Well, I don't, it's interesting that that was the takeaway. Um, we didn't mean to imply that uh, really at all. Um, in, in terms of the uh, objective vis-a-vis -vis the West, I think we, we the evidence suggests that Russia has pretty uh, aggressive, if not a, um, assertive, 
uh, assertive, if not aggressive objectives as um, at least its actions bear out. I don't think there's any other way of understanding um, episodes such as the interference that occurred even after the 2016 election was over where, you know, there were efforts on both sides to, of the US political spectrum seemingly just to, um, to, uh, to create uh, uh, discontent and discord within uh, within the U.S. and those are just examples that were covered during the report, uh, the the period when we were writing, which, as I mentioned, uh, was a while back. So we certainly didn't um, mean to imply that in terms of Russia's objectives. I'll let Dara speak to the capabilities picture, but um, that was not our our uh, intended uh, message by any means. Right. I you know from the work that we did on the military side, I would say that. It's important to right size the type of threat that Russia can pose using the resources that it has now and into the future. So if we are looking at what they're developing, um, our research is suggesting that they're actually increasing um, their armor, increasing the echelon of warfare that they feel like they are going to uh, need. So does that mean a return to a 1944 style march across Europe? in that way, no, but they are developing a very strong, powerful, rapid reaction type of initial blow. They are developing the capability for long range and medium range conventional precision strike. So there, there are issues here, um, but if you're comparing their plans and their structure from now over the next decade and comparing that to you know, what, what China's cranking out, which you know has a lot of those three pillars of expeditionary power that we were talking about, it's a bit of a different animal. So it's just about identifying where that threat is and, and where it can't be. Thank you. Okay, terrific, thanks. Um, so there are also, um, I mean, there have been, again, among the many interesting questions, um, there are a couple about um, changes over time. So maybe uh, let me pose, first of all, one from Iris Strauss who asks um, about what continuities or changes uh, do you uh, find compared to Russian grand strategy in the early 1990s? And um, whether your observations correspond to the heated rejection of the earlier period in most Russian foreign policy discussion. Um, then there's also a question from Melissa Shostak who asked about something a little more specific, um, which is, has there been a shift in Russian appetite for creating an expeditionary force or creating expeditionary forces in the last a couple years. Um, she notes there have been several instances where Russia has discussed creating military bases outside its near abroad, such as discussions this year about um, naval base in Sudan, uh, for example. Um, so maybe take those and then we'll go to other subjects after. Okay, I would just, uh, on the time uh, question, um, I think, well, first of all, just as a methodological matter, we did bound our, our examination of, you know, in the period of 2012 to 2018, uh, trying to, as best we could, control for um, the, uh, you know, Putin's term, essentially, uh, and um, uh, basically just keep it within a, a certain time frame that seemed to make sense for a couple of different methodological reasons. Uh, and so we did not look at the grand sweep of changes over the course of the entirety of the post-Soviet period. I would say, though, that just in the way that um, the uh, unipolar era or the, 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 the moment from which the system is currently transitioning is portrayed in the strategy documents, um, obviously does suggest that, that is the characterization of the um, the the outgoing period, which was the unipolar moment, uh, Russia saw a lot of problems in that setup, um, which does implicitly suggest that the 1990s um, were problematic or the 90s through the early 2000s in terms of uh, uh, um, their assessment of the way the world um, system was uh, functioning. I'll let Derek take the second one. Sure, and, and I would say, you know, just from, you know, changes in, in Russian grand strategy that we detected um, from the military, military strategy side of the house. You know, if you go back to, you know, the period of 2008, 2009, which is outside the scope of our study, uh, the Russian military leadership team, um, you know, there's, there's debate, there's a spectrum of ideas um, for how the Russian military should be looking. And at the time, the, the group at the top, 
um, led by uh, General Makarov and um, Anatoly Sergikov, they had this vision for the Russian military that was modeled in many ways um, after the US military, whether that was a brigade structure, um, everybody gets you know, tomahawks or their equivalent, you know, that's how we're gonna fight wars. Um, they, they, they were out there sort of on the end of a spectrum that was a little uh, very different from Russian military tradition. And so you find when the new team came in, um, in 2012, and certainly um, this trend accelerated after um, the events in Ukraine, you see a, a course correction, you know, slightly towards uh, more of the center where you do need more ground power. You do need larger echelons in your force, like regiments and divisions that are capable of um, going after, you know, slightly larger pieces of territory. So, you know, I, I see that, that revision and, and we discuss those things in detail. Um, in the report and with respect to the expeditionary question so again our analysis here is you know stopped in, in 2019 but i i wouldn't say that there's been a huge shift or progress frankly in this area so if you look at the kind of things that russia needs to be purchasing to enable this they're just not really purchasing those um, whether that's um, refurbishing their sea lift refurbishing their strategic airlift uh, I think we have a few quotes in our report that Russia, with what they have on hand right now, would struggle just to meet their domestic requirements to move from Eastern Russia to Western Russia, which is quite a long, quite a long journey um, if you're going to fly it. So I, I don't, if there is a desire for that, it is not being matched in any type of resource decisions. They have also been trying for quite a long time to get basing access, either in Africa or other places. And, and when I say a long time, I mean like a decade, and they just aren't able to get it over the line um, and actually make these things solid. Um, e even the Sudan situation has, has changed um, a few times in the last months. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think I'm gonna continue with a few questions that are sort of at a, a bit more general level. And then we have a lot of questions on specific topics that interest people. And so I'll try to get to those as best I can. So um, first of all, there's a question about um, how would the report have changed if at all, uh, had you been able to incorporate the new national security strategy? That is a uh, excellent question. Um, and uh, would require me to, I think, more time to think about than, than we have here. Um, what I would say is that I don't think anything in the report is directly contradicted. Um, we didn't choose elements of uh, Russian grand strategy that uh, are no longer valid as a result of the national security strategy, the new national security strategy. Um, that having been said, one piece that I would note is that the um, the the way uh, interaction with the West is discussed in the new national security strategy is markedly different um, and much less sort of uh, with, with really only token references to cooperation um, uh, compared to the past. So I think that that change um, uh, is one at least that comes to mind. I don't know if uh, Dara, you had any other um, so I would say that um, you know this whole concept about you know external threats and internal things I think that was strengthened. Um, they emphasized yeah. that a bit more. Um, the new national security strategy I think is like a really odd duck of a document. Like it maybe should have been revised a few times in draft before it was signed off on. But it's just my perspective because it's a little just different and kind of organized in a way that's unusual compared to the other sort of pantheon of documents that we looked at. Um, there were not really any blockbuster changes on the defense side and on the military side. I think the interesting thing to note was they basically cut all references to arms control, which I thought was highly unusual. And I, I wonder how the MFA um, feels about that. <laughs> OK, um, great, thanks. And so. Um... There is a, um, a, a question for elaboration on a couple things from uh, Hernan Villagran. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, and that is um, 
Uh, he asked for some elaboration on how Russia sees threats to internal stability. Um, how are they defined? Um, would they include things like climate change related breakdowns? Um, and uh, the second uh, question, is, uh, it, the clarifying uh, question he has is about um, how Russia sees changes in the international environment. So what are kind of the relevant changes that it sees there? Uh, you want to start with the first with the internal threats, or you want me to? Yeah, I'll um, I'll start with the internal threats and I'll kick it over to for the international environment. Um, so uh, it used to be, and then this was you know outside the scope of our study that when Russia would discuss internal threats, that was meant um, you know coming off the heels of you know the the sort of the North Caucasus situation in the 1990s. Um, terrorism, extremism, separatism, like those kind of things were sort of the primary. Those are still important, but now they've, they've tacked on another element to it, which is this concept of color revolutions or um, anti-Russian sentiment being kicked up from abroad and, you know, trying to overthrow the stability of the Russian regime. So it's, it's changing and it's modifying. So whether that's outside actors trying to agitate people internally um, inside Russia or um, the establishment of anti-Russian governments along Russia's border areas that can then beam that sort of sentiment back in. Uh, that's, that's really, um, to me, uh, been the modification um, to, to looking at internal threats. Just to tack on quickly there, it's it's it, it, the, the at least the way it's written about it does not include sort of transnational challenges like climate change and uh, and and uh, and those sorts of things. Um, but uh, I mean, I think that just in, to be very brief, the key transition in the international system that that is noted is the what they see as uh, the sort of inevitable and increasing power transition away from the you know, traditional West to what they call new centers of power, um, defined as you know, the, the, the BRICS, the, the Gulf countries, um, and, uh, and that's, I think, the core framework through, through which um, the rest of their assessment of the international system goes, that we're in this sort of transition period, um, and uh, that explains on a macro level the major actor's behavior. The West is resisting this change, um, uh, and uh, others are set to benefit from it um, as a result. Oh, and in the interim, things are going to be really turbulent. Did we lose you, Henry? Okay. Yeah, oh, there you are. I'm back. Can you hear me now? Okay, um, so um, uh, there are a, uh, a series of questions. Can people hear me okay? Oops. Um, let, let, me, uh, let me just say it, uh, hopefully people can hear. So there are a series of questions about Russia's willingness and preparedness to um, do certain things uh, that you, know, you might've encountered as part of your analysis. Um, so one would be uh, preparedness and willingness to escalate from regional contingencies to uh, larger scale war, possibly involving missiles. Um, second would be cooperation, um, like arms control. Uh, you know, kind of uh, how, how, how does this relate to the arms control engagement willingness and um, military to military uh, contacts. So was the question on how the evolution of those things are going to impact the, the latter? Um, so, you know, let me start with Mill Mill, um, both in this, this project and another um, that I worked on for the Air Force, you, you see a, a very sharp um, decline in um, Mill Mill relationships between <clears throat> Russia and the West. And I think a large part of that was our defense relationship was essentially frozen after um, the Ukraine conflict. So Russia has been able to pivot that energy elsewhere um, and, and into different types of engagements and training exercises with non-Western partners. There's a certain amount of, of energy and free space there and they've, they've, they've converted it. 
Um, I think, you know, in terms of um, larger scale um, conflict focused and implications for arms control, I think the, the one, at least from, from my vantage point, that's um, changing the most rapidly is uh, weapons that are occupying the space um, from the former INF treaty. Uh, Russia is developing a suite of missiles that can now operate from that intermediate range, and they're fielding them, um, you know, within the next few years. We are doing the same. Uh, I, you know, I don't know as, as time goes on and we're fielding these things, how easy it will be to put that, you know, back in an arms control box. But other than that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sam for his thoughts. Uh, maybe just briefly, the, the implication, I, I think, that um, of uh, Dara's analysis about the um, return to a more, uh, the regional echelon of, of conflict and, and that being reflected in, in, in uh, force posture decisions, particularly after 2014, although we don't discuss this in the report, I mean, you can see the consequences for I mean, what that am amounts to essentially is a, a, a greater permanent uh, or at least um, regular presence of significant conventional forces on Russia's Western periphery. And uh, although conventional arms control in Europe is largely moribund, um, that does pose challenges, I think, for uh, um, you know, an arms control regime in the future. Okay, um, I've turned off my video just in case that uh, helps the audio. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so maybe let me just ask um, a couple um, of, the, of the questions or a couple touch on a couple of themes for a final wrap up, which is, first of all, there is um, a question about uh, the, the tools of power that Moscow has. Um, so there's a question about, apart from coercion, um, do you see any efficient tools of influence at Moscow's hands in the former Soviet Union? And there was another comment on uh, kind of soft power, that possibility, and um, uh, you know, the view is expressed that Russia doesn't have any soft power that can be used. So I wonder if you might comment on that. Um, then there was a question uh, asked early on, so apologies only to getting it to it now from Plamentev, who asked, um, are there particular NATO and EU countries that Russia aims to weaken? Uh, so maybe there's no, you know, the grand strategy might not apply, as I understood his question, um, you know, it, it, for Europe or the West as a whole, but maybe for particular uh, countries. Um, uh, so is Russia aiming to, to target particular countries for weakening? Um, so uh, I, I have to apologize for people who didn't get their questions uh, addressed, but unfortunately, we only have a short amount of time for this. But let me uh, turn to the authors for kind of, and any, uh, and any other final comments you want to squeeze in at the end before we wrap up. Okay, um, I think, so the way we looked at, uh, the reason why the, I was focused on coercion in my discussion of Russia's um, uh, dealings with its neighbors, not only because there's been a lot of it, but also um, I think we, we used it in a very particular way. Um, basically, the, the hypothesis being that a regional power would resort to coercion when it sees some sort of threat. So that basically tells us something about its bottom line, that uh, the kind of level of uh, attitude from a neighboring state that Russia would accept without resorting to coercion suggests that that is uh, at least acceptable. Uh, whereas when they do resort to coercion, you can, uh, you can, um, it's implicitly uh, um, suggesting that Russia finds the level of regional integration or uh, the hierarchical, the nature of the hierarchical relationship to be unacceptable. Um, so we weren't uh, we were focused on the coercion um, uh, piece of it because it, it, of what it tells us about um, Russian intentions, uh, um, not because it's necessarily the only piece of the puzzle. Um, well, while the conclusion uh, in, in, in the end was that, you know, Russia's limited economic and political influence does prevents it from achieving its goals, I think the way to achieve it, to understand that is not that Russia doesn't have any soft power. Of course it does. And so outside of the context of the report, I would stipulate that, particularly in its neighboring countries um, uh, and you know, through historical, linguistic, and so on, other um, means, uh, but that you know, it, it does, um, it, is a, it is 
telling that the, the resort to coercion is necessary to uh, achieve the kind of outcomes that Russia wants. So if, for example, Russia's soft power in the context of Ukraine were so um, uh, compelling that it could basically get what it wanted without resorting to coercion, which is, of course, the point of soft power, um, then it presumably wouldn't have in, invaded uh, and annexed Crimea and, and, and gotten involved in the Donbass. So the point being that, you know, I think that the, 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 there are limits to what um, is soft power alone can get Russia in terms of integration outcomes. Um, and uh, I think that's the, that, that's the way to understand that, that point on our slide, at least. Uh, and the, the other, oh, weakening particular countries vis-a-vis -vis the entire West. So, I mean, you know, here it's just a matter of what, what evidence you point to and whether you believe it or not. I mean, you know, we saw last week, at least uh, in the New York Times, that there's um, some evidence that Russia was assisting uh, the Catalan separatist movement. Um, it's hard to see how that uh, is consistent with uh, a, a um, with the stated grand strategy, and it certainly would be consistent with the idea of weakening Spain in this case and, and the EU as a whole. Um, so uh, I think, you know, I focused the, the evidence available at the time of our writing was much more significant because of the release of all the Mueller indictments and so on in the case of the US. So that's why I focused on the US in my comments. But um, I think there are at least, depending on your assessment of the reliability of the evidence, some evidence uh, that is similar for other countries as well. Hey, Dara, any final, final comments? Or? Yeah, just uh, one final comment that is, uh, I'll tack on to the previous, you know, Russia, you know, they do have soft power tools. They're not maybe the same as how we conceptualize soft power, um, but Russia does have a different worldview and a world sort of idea for organizing the international order that may be appealing to many different kinds of countries. So if you think about the brand that they're offering, and they really made quite a strong play for it in that um, national security strategy they just released. You know, the Russia partnering with Russia versus partnering with the United States, um, their brand, if you will, is one that focuses on traditional values. It focuses on um, you know looking the other way about domestic matters um, and focusing on the concept of national sovereignty and, and national independence, and not doing groupthink or or block-based decisions. Um, so, you know, that is an appealing message um, to many countries in, in the world that are maybe not where, you know, the Western liberal order is. So it's, it's just important to keep in mind that they, they, you know, as Sam has pointed out, they can't necessarily offer prosperity or lots of money or these kind of things, but um, there is a, a different political organization there that others might find appealing. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, your presentation today. I think it's a fascinating um, analysis, a very important analysis for people to engage with. And I, I think its uh, uh, relevance uh, is uh, kind of uh, you know, given testimony by all the, the questions uh, that we had today and all the comments. So I um, encourage people to go look it up. Again, if you haven't uh, uh, kind of captured the link here, uh, I'm sure you can find it just by uh, Googling uh, Russian grand strategy, rhetoric and reality at RAND. Um, and so we hope you'll uh, uh, go there and also uh, join us at future events on relevant topics. So thank you all for uh, joining us today and um, wish you a happy rest of your Monday.